I could be looking up at the stars. I could be looking up at the stars. Welcome back, everyone. Today, let's dive into Canto 10 of Paradiso and try and see what happens, because this is another really complex and difficult canto full of beauty so full of beauty and so full of um, visual miracles that dante creates um, almost to the point of uh, if you really go let your imagination go as you read the canto you almost feel like you get to the end and you had had you have had a hallucination because of the the, the, the visual things that and objects that dante creates in your mind it's incredible so I'll uh, try to do a brief introduction. First of all, this is a canto that uh, probably only a medievalist or a theologian could fully, fully understand because the cast of characters is immense and, uh, and also the relationships between all these characters presupposes a pretty deep understanding and knowledge of uh, at least the main schools of thought of philosophical and theological thought um, during the 13th century and i don't have that i'm not that person uh, but uh, i have uh, an overall understanding of uh, at least uh, what mattered to dante and so i'm going to try and focus on that like i mentioned in the previous video canto 10 in every cantica is very important because it's a moment when dante takes off Dante uh, wants to draw a demarcation line between everything that is before Canto 10 in each cantica and everything that is above. So his language elevates, his tone changes, and uh, in Paradiso in particular, we see this, uh, this big difference. We see this big difference in um, many different elements. For example, uh, physically and astronomically, Dante knew that uh, the Earth was projecting his, uh, sh its shadow out to only until the circle of Venus. In other words, uh, the Earth's shadow had a length that was projected by the Sun only and at particular times, of course, not all the time, only on the Moon, on uh, Mercury and on Venus, which are the three circles that we, we have been visiting so far. Beyond Venus, the Earth has not, no more its uh, shadow, and therefore, translating this spiritually, it doesn't have its, uh, its effect anymore, its earthly effect. As a consequence, we see how not only Dante wants to take us into a more abstract, more high territory with his language and with his imagery, but also all the souls that we're going to meet from now on are all souls whose life was lived in a way that was fully dedicated to God. The way they lived their life, consecrated to God and sanctified in, in, uh, in some cases, was fully dedicated to God, to praying, to writing as theologians, to work and live as, as saints. So it's uh, in the circle of the sun that we meet St. Thomas Aquinas first, and this is what personally excites me because I love St. Thomas Aquinas. I love him even if I haven't read the majority of what he has written. Um, I know a lot about him. I would in fact uh, start with uh, suggesting to anybody a really great book that is a little under um, valued or underrated by Louis de Vol that in English, the English version is called The Quiet Light, A Life of St. Thomas. It's a biography of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's a little bit of a um, historic fiction. But something that is really interesting is that the Italian version of this book is titled La Liberazione del Gigante, which translates into the freeing of the giant. And it has a beautiful double meaning. It means the freeing of the giant because St. Thomas Aquinas, in his biography, as a boy, as a young man, was in fact imprisoned in the family tower where his family had imprisoned him to because they didn't allow him to 
join the particular convent that he wanted to join. They had some more ambitious plans for him, but he didn't want to, to follow what his family wanted for him. So somebody helped him escape from this tower and therefore the freeing of the giant. Let's remember that St. Thomas was physically really, really big, tall and, and big. He had a nickname as, uh, I believe, the quiet ox. And the second meaning is the freeing of the giant. In, uh, if for giant we mean Aristotle, through uh, Thomas' uh, lifelong dedication and work, he was able to free, under the Christian doctrine light, Aristotle and Aristotle's thinking and, uh, and work from uh, some different currents, like for example, and specifically the one from uh, Muslim philosopher Averroes, they were trying to appropriate Aristotle and make it, let's say, absorbing into their own philosophy. So he was able to free Aristotle uh, from those uh, type of currents and uh, move him much closer and integrate him into Christianity. From this sphere of the sun, which is the fourth one, onward, we're going to have the sun, we have Mars, the sphere of Jupiter, and then finally the sphere of Saturn. And uh, Dante really organized this, uh, these levels, but not only him, it was something that it had already been written, following the four cardinal virtues within the circle of the sun, what he sings about is the virtue of wisdom. And that's why we find all these wise men and theologians in the circle of the sun. In the next circle, which is the circle of Mars, he will be singing the virtue of warriors or the, the virtue of war, what he meant to be virtues in war, in particular in, uh, in his times. Then there is the heaven of Jupiter, where uh, uh, justice is the virtue that is going to be celebrated. And finally, in the, in the heaven of Saturn, Dante will celebrate the virtue of temperance, which really translates into the virtue of contemplation, the ascetics. These are the saints that are being celebrated there. So in this reading of Canto 10, I am uh, proposing a reading that splits the canto in about seven parts. And these seven parts are simply my personal preference in how to read it, because it's really, really complex. As always, Dante, it seems to be front-loading his cantos with uh, such uh, dense first ter tercets, like in this case. So we, we need to spend a little bit of time here. And uh, let's start. This is the first uh, part that I personally would consider only the first two tercets from verse 1 to verse 6. Guardando nel suo figlio con amore, che l'uno e l'altro eternalmente spira, lo primo è ineffabile valore, quanto per mente e per loco si gira, con tant'ordine e fe, che esser non puote, senza gustar di lui chi ciò rimi. Now, in two tercets, what Dante does here is to introduce and summarize the concept of the Trinity. As we have discussed in the very beginning of, of this uh, series about Paradiso, two of the main goals of Paradiso for Dante are to, for Dante the character as well, are to understand and uh, be able to explain to his readers the two main mysteries of Christianity, the Incarnation and the Trinity. We have just uh, finished with the previous canto to analyze and to reflect and meditate upon the Incarnation as one of the main mysteries. Now, for the first time, Dante really introduces to us the mystery of the Trinity itself. And uh, the language is already very beautiful and very high. He is referring to God as lo primo e ineffabile valore, the first and ineffable value. Mandelbaum says the power first and inexpressible. He's referring to the son as il suo figlio, his son. And then he's, re he's referring to the Holy Spirit as l'amore, che l'uno e l'altro eternalmente spira, that which one and the other breathe eternally. Quanto per mente e per loco si gira. Si gira means uh, it turns. It, it, all these uh, spheres, are, they keep moving, they keep turning. And this movement is initiated first per mente, which literally means through mind. But Dante is referring to the angelic minds, to the angelic intelligences, 
and we know how uh, different orders of angels in, in Dante's uh, theology are predisposed to manage every different uh, circle of heaven. So the angelic intelligences are the ones who, who move the circles per mente, e per loco means uh, through the place or it refers to the space. Mandelbaum says, made everything that wheels through mind and space. So he doesn't really explain the concepts, he, he translates literally. Um, let us see what uh, Robert Hollander does with this uh, first verse. Hollander says, um, the inexpressible and primal power, uh, referring to God, made with such order all things that revolve that he who studies it in mind and in space cannot but taste of him. So also Hollander does the same. He actually translates uh, mind and space. Somebody who could have uh, done something different is uh, our dear Robin Kirkpatrick, who's generally one of the most daring translators of uh, the Divine Comedy. Um, let's see how he translated this one. Kirkpatrick says, uh, the first and threefold worth beyond all words formed all that spins through intellect or space in such clear order it can never be that we in wonder fail to taste him there i like the fact that he's using intellect instead of mind because really it's closer to the meaning that dante wants to give to this word mente mente literally means mind but intellect i think is more precise so i i do like Kirkpatrick's translation God created con tant'ordine with all this order, Kesser non puote senza gustar di lui chi ciò rimira, with such a perfect order that if we are, if I am contemplating it, I, I cannot help but uh, not only enjoy it, but also see through something of that uh, divine perfection through its order. This is uh, referred to all the universe. I could be looking up at the stars and uh, in the beauty of the stars see something of the divine beauty, of the divine perfection. We do have a way to try and think of the concept of Trinity in the simplest possible way. And this is the one uh, that, I, that I found in my experience. We know from the scriptures that God is love, that God is love. There is a, an equivalence between God and love. And uh, we could say that the Trinity is the, a very elaborate and sophisticated way to express the concept that God is love. Because one person, how can one person or one being be love without a sense of relationship? Within the Trinity, we have God as the lover, we have the Son as the beloved, and then we have the Holy Spirit that is the love that unites them. We can also see this from an anthropog anthropological standpoint, and this is something that helps me understand the concept of Trinity. Not that I think I'm doing a great job now, but I'm sharing with you where I have got in my own speculation and trying to understand it, that uh, relationship is really the fundamental core of what we are as human beings, we are zone politicon, like Aristotle said, and uh, a human being by herself or by himself is lacking something. We, our own uh, identity, our own being as humans is relationship. This is, a, I think, a profound uh, insight in the nature of man, in the nature of our existence. And uh, to put this type of concept of relationship and love at the very core, at the very heart of our life, is a very wise thing, at least from the Catholic standpoint. The second part of uh, Canto 10 uh, begins with uh, verse 7, and uh, it's Dante talking to us, to us, the readers. He talks to us with a very structured triple tercet, because everything is in three. He just talked about the Trinity, three, perfection. Now he has to give us a triple tercet, where in the beginning of every tercet, there is an imperative, an imperative verb, directed to us. Leva dunque lettore, ad alte rote, meco la vista, dritto a quella parte, dove l'un moto e l'altro si percuote. E lì comincia a vagheggiar nell'arte di quel maestro che dentro a sé l'ama, tanto che mai da lei l'occhio non parte. 
Vedi come da Indis di Rama l'oblico cerchio che i pianeti porta per soddisfare al mondo che li chiama. So we have three imperatives which are leva, comincia vagheggiar, and vedi, they mean lift your eyes, begin to look, and see there the circle. So lift your eyes, begin to look and see. And also, if we think about the type of action that he's describing, it's uh, one single action that he's asking us to do, to perform, but broken down in three steps. We first need to look up, then second, we have to start, begin to gaze towards uh, the point that he's telling us, and then vedi, or it means to see or to understand. So it's a single action really that he's asking us to, to do. It's almost as if Dante is asking us to look up at the stars and uh, listen to a brief um, astronomy lesson now by him because the entire canto, the entire canto 10, uh, even if it's really about St. Thomas and the wise men, it can also be read as a, a very deep astronomy lecture. There is a lot of astronomy in, in this canto. So let's try to look at it at least from a, from a high level. When Dante says at verse 8, a quella parte, a quella parte of the sky, which means to that part of the sky, he means precisely to tell us that we should look up at the equinox of spring, which uh, chronologically and temporally speaking is where the action of the Divine Comedy finds itself in this moment. They are around the equinox of spring. So Dante is uh, telling us, like the astronomers in his times knew, knew very well, that the heavenly body, in fact, his astronomy might sound a little bit uh, ridiculous in part to us, especially the Earth at the center of the universe, but there are many, many elements that were, let's say, bang on uh, precise back then, so let's be careful about uh, dismissing it all. Uh, Dante is telling us that the heavenly bodies, all of them, have two opposing movements, especially seen from Earth. One of these movements is the daily movement from east to west that follows the plane of our equator, the Earth equator, and the other movement, the first one is daily, the other movement is annual, so every year, or zodiacal, we could call it, because it is the movement of the zodiac, from west to east in the plane of the ecliptic. Now, what is this ecliptic? I am going to link a very nice video that I found where the concept of ecliptic is explained very, very well and very simply in only three minutes, and it helped me understand it better. So if you are curious, if you are interested, please stop my video and, and look at that one because it's only two and a half, three minutes. But in brief, the ecliptic is a, a great circle, a grandiose circle on the celestial sphere that represents the, the sun's path, but the, the sun's apparent path, what it looks to us from Earth, the sun's apparent path during the year. So this is the ecliptic. And uh, something that Dante helped, helped me also understand is the fact that uh, when we talk about the zodiac, we talk about uh, the uh, today the 13 constellations that are touched by the apparent trajectory of the sun during the year. When we are moving around the sun uh, during the year, we see the sun doing an itinerary, an itinerary in the background of the very distant stars. And this itinerary touches historically it used to touch 12 constellations. Now it touches 13, but that's the where the zodiac comes from, which is also very interesting from an etymology point of view, because uh, zodiac comes from uh, the Greek words zodiacus kiklos, which means uh, the circle of animals. And if you think about it, it's really the each shape is referred to an animal and it's a circle of uh, different shapes even if each star is at different uh, distances, etc. Very fascinating history of astronomy that dates, that predates the ancient Greeks. It goes back to the Sumerian, Mesopotamian, and who knows how far, how farther back as well. So Dante picks up on that and he tells us that uh, we, the readers, should gaze directly at that part where the one motion strikes against the other. 
this is the equinox of spring because is that part where one motion one motion is the elliptic is uh, striking against the other and the other being the zodiacal motion the motion of the zodiac we should see the circle branching from the cross point obliquely this is also a very important point uh, it's important spiritually most of all because dante is saying look how oblique this uh, circle is uh, the zodiac to bear the planets that satisfy the world in need of them what does this mean it means that um, if the path of the zodiac was not let's say inflected or, or, or oblique if it wasn't oblique uh, the influence in heaven would be useless would be fruitless and almost uh, everything on earth below would fail we wouldn't have basically the seasons that we have that allow the generation of life it is because of this obliquity of the zodiac which causes the changes of the seasons that the sun can produce the effect for which it was designed which is to to change the temperature to have the movement in the winds to really originate life and growth in plants and animals in dante's time and even before they were very aware of this uh, oscillation let's say of uh, the earth in relation to the sun that allows for the seasons well i live in los angeles so i don't know what seasons are to be honest but in the rest of the world much of the rest of the world i hear that there are seasons and that allows for generation of life so that's really what dante means when he says at verse 20 se dal dritto più o meno lontano fosse il partire assai sarebbe manco e giù e su dell'ordine mondano if this partire that i would call the divergence between uh, the su e giù this oscillation of the sun let's see what mandelbaum does here he says and if the zodiac swerved more or less far from the straight course um, then earth's harmony would be defective in both hemispheres the point being god has prepared everything in a perfect way for the presence of uh, life and for the preservation of life on earth this uh, second part of the canto ends with uh, uh, another admonition from dante to us as the readers where he says orti riman lettor we are the lettor the reader lettore is still in modern italian a word that means reader lettore leggere is the word for reading sovra il tuo banco dietro pensando a ciò che si preliba d'essere voi lieto assai, assai prima che stanco messo to innanzi o mai per te ti ciba che a sé torce tutta la mia cura quella materia on dio son fatto scriba he calls himself again the scribe of god the scriba the scribe of god very interesting and fun the way that he uses a lot of uh, eating related metaphors here and uh, the verb that um, dante uses here at verse 25 messo messo is the participle of uh, the verb mettere even in modern italian that today it means to put to put something uh, in general but in dante's time it was used uh, with the meaning of uh, preparing the table to preparing the table to eat so i have prepared a table for you reader now it's on you you have to eat the food and uh, enjoy i cannot eat the food for you this is what, he, what, what he's saying che tutta la mia cura because for what concerns me dante says i am in uh, in a haste in a, in a desire to just turn all of my attention and focus on the subject that i am writing about here starts the third part part number three uh, lo ministro maggior della natura this is verse number 28 and uh, the major minister the great minister of nature is the sun lo ministro maggior della natura che del valor del ciel lo mondo imprenta e col suo lume il tempo ne misura con quella parte che su si rammenta congiunto si girava per le spire in che piuttosto ognora si presenta there is again a lot of astronomy here and uh, as you can see from the english translation not everything is very clear because he's referring to astronomical concepts that he's giving for granted with the, my own bad personal translation i would try to translate this as simply as the sun that is the major minister of nature the sun 
with that within that part that I talked about earlier, which is the part of the sky that is the equinox of spring. So in that part of this uh, portion of the sky, it's uh, it was moving in its spiral movement in its in its own spiral movement in a way that uh, the sun is rising earlier every day because we are in between the solstice of winter and uh, the equinox of spring or later basically we are in between the solstice of winter and the solstice of summer and in all this period of time the sun is uh, rising earlier and earlier every day so this is verse 32 this type of uh, spiraling movement uh, once again it's an apparent movement of the sun we need to clarify it's just that it looks like in following the zodiac, in following the constellations, the sun moves in a in a spiraling way and not simply in a straight line. Very meaningful the fact that uh, only after having done this introduction in this third part, at verse 34, Dante says, E io era con lui. So only here Dante steps into the scene after having introduced the sun and everything that the sun is doing. So this is a way for Dante to give more relevance and importance to the sun and not being too much uh, egocentric, I guess, but io era con lui, very simple, very brief. Ma del salire non mi accorsi io, se non come uomo s'accorge, anzi il primo pensier del suo venire. Beautiful, beautiful. Just like we do not realize about a, a sudden thought popping out from our brain before it actually pops out, in the same way he hasn't realized that he's already on the fourth heaven, in the fourth heaven with Beatrice. And more specifically, they are inside the sun, not only on the fourth heaven, but they are inside the sun. He is saying here, E Beatrice quella che si scorge. Just as a note, be careful because this E Beatrice should have an accent on the on the E. If it doesn't, it's a mistake. It should have an accent on the E because otherwise it, it changes the meaning. E Beatrice quella che si scorge, di bene in meglio. Uh, si subitamente che l'atto suo per tempo non si sporge. So not only he's not perceiving space anymore in this type of movement that he had from the heaven of Venus to the heaven of the sun, but he's not even perceiving time. Here then we get to this visual invention that is astounding, where he sees uh, a lot of souls and lights who are inside the light of the sun, but incredibly they are somehow brighter than the light of the sun because he can see them and he can distinguish them not because of different color but because they are brighter which is incredible this is uh, one of the first times in paradiso where dante introduces this topos of ineffability of what he is seeing per chio l'ongegno e l'arte e l'uso chiami I, I can use my intellect ingegno my art l'arte e l'uso my experience because I'm an experienced poet and I call I can call on them a lot but there's really nothing I can do still within uh, the this third part that we are examining Dante uh, gives us a quick description of finally of where he is he is la quarta famiglia he calls it a family the fourth family is really the fourth heaven the heaven of the sun dell'alto padre che sempre la sazia mostrando come spira e come figlia once again, very quickly, like a lightning, he has given us a reference to the Trinity, to the concept of the Trinity, because he mentions l'Alto Padre, God, mostrando come spira, how God uh, breathes forth, and that's the Spirit, and how God engenders the Son. So once again, he is echoing the first two tercets of the canto here. Now, part number four of, of this canto. Before introducing us to the wise souls, Dante is presenting to us another wonderful scene, wonderful scene, which goes from verse 52 to verse 63. And this is uh, what I call, in my own division, the fourth portion. E Beatrice cominciò, ringrazia, ringrazia il sol degli angeli, che a questo sensibile ti ha levato per sua grazia. Cordi mortal, non fu mai sì di gesto a divozione e a rendersi a Dio con tutto il suo gradir con tanto presto come a quelle parole mi feci io it's a intimation 
to be as grateful as possible for everything that God has done for him so far to bring him here through Beatrice, through Virgil as well. And, uh, and Dante is extremely grateful and he tries to express it. Something really, really remarkable here is that uh, he says, Tutto il mio amore in lui si mise, all my love went in God in that moment with all my gratitude. Che Beatrice eclissò nell'oblio. In this type of uh, moment of focus on God, I forgot about Beatrice. And uh, non le dispiacque, she didn't mind. Beatrice didn't mind, but actually she was smiling about it, she was joyful about it. And uh, what a simple but uh, wise lesson we can get from this couple of verses of the independence of partners or spouses uh, from each other when uh, there is something higher than the love for each other that each one can get lost into and still respect and, and love each other in a very solid way and still unite them at the same time. So part five starts with verse uh, 64. And uh, here is where Dante really starts giving us his own, his full vision. Io vidi più folgor vivi e vincenti far di noi centro e di se far corona. I see this as a, an incredible, unforgettable vision. He is suspended in the sun and with Beatrice. And he's seeing this uh, crown, this circle of 12 lights. We're going to see that in the next couple of cantos, another circle of another 12 lights will add their own luminescence to this incredible spectacle. Surrounding them, encircling them, dancing and singing and producing music. Più dolci in voce che in vista docenti. Not only they were splendid in their in their sight, in, in seeing them, the way they looked, but they were even better and more pleasant in the way their, their, their voices were sounding. Mandelbaum says, uh, Latona's daughter circled, we see Latona's daughter circle when saturated air holds fast. He's referring to the moon here, to the moon when there is some vapors in the air and therefore there is a, a crown of vapor all around. Such a beautiful, a beautiful image here. The thread that forms the girdle of our halo. It's really a halo around it. Si che ritenga il fil che fa la zona. Nella corte del cielo, on Dio rivegno, he's saying, I am coming back to earth because I'm, I'm on earth, I'm writing this divine comedy. So on Dio rivegno, I am back from, from the heavens. You can find a lot of jewels, si trovano molte gioie, this gioie means uh, gems and jewels, care e belle, tanto che beautiful, tanto che non si possono trar del regno, trar, the verb is trarre, it means really take away from the realm, you have to keep them there. E il canto di quel lume era di quelle, the, the singing of these lights is one of these jewels that I couldn't take away from there. Chi non si impenna, Si, che la su voli, dal muto aspetti quindi le novelle. Another really fun, fun way to express the ineffability of everything uh, that actually has some biblical undertones because Isaiah in uh, 40, verse 40 or 31 of Isaiah says, Those who hope in the Lord will soar on wings like eagles. Chi non si impenna means uh, who doesn't put wings on themselves and therefore who doesn't really soar uh, with their hope in God, with their faith in God. He can expect the, the tale of all that I saw to be told by a mute person, by a mute person. Such a, a weird uh, way to express the ineffability of this. Then this beautiful circle or crown of lights move three times, circle Dante and Beatrice three times, and then they stop, but they don't stop in a definitive way, they stop with a clear, visible desire to continue. These are 12 souls, and the number 12 has a lot of biblical references, of course, the number of the apostles, but 12, given that this canto is so much about astronomy, probably is also referring to the number of the constellations. The reference to the Fermi Poli, the fixed poles, simply means that uh, from there the stars seem to be moving a little bit slower, so that's why they, they slow down. Donne mi parve, non da ballo sciolte, the dance is not finished, but it's only interrupted for now. 
And now we get to the sixth part of the canto, the part where we get the introduction to each one of these 12 incredible souls. They are all wise men. In other words, they are theologians, some of the greatest theologians and philosophers of uh, mostly Dante's times, and some of them are from previous centuries as well. Something to note here, that's uh, you know, a, a scene that's reminding us of Canto IV of Inferno, where in this garden, in the castle, Aristotle was sitting in the middle of the little hill, and all the great spirits, the great minds, were surrounding him, were surrounding Aristotle. So it's similar here, but the main difference, the crucial difference, is that those great minds in Canto IV of Inferno had followed the same thirst for truth and the same hunger for uh, understanding, for knowledge, but without having the light of faith. And in this sixth part, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas is the one who introduces Dante to all the other ones. There is a lot to be said about uh, the structure that Dante follows in Canto 10, 11 and 12. Of course, St. Thomas is a Dominican and uh, he is the one who is uh, uh, introducing this circle. Later on, in the next canto, he will introduce us to St. Francis. And Dante had this idea to have St. Thomas singing the praises of St. Francis because of the rivality, that they were rivals, Dominicans and uh, Franciscans. And then later, we're going to have uh, St. Bonaventure, who's a Franciscan, singing the praises of the Dominicans. There is a strong program here by, from Dante's side to bring harmony, to bring unity in uh, this world of uh, many of them great theologians who maybe during their earthly life were competing, were rivals, but uh, in, in heaven they are living in a great harmonious unity. And uh, that is also highlighted by the way this particular Canto 10 ends, and we'll see that. I don't think I have enough time to go through a proper explanation of each one of these uh, of these 12 uh, figures because uh, it would take such a long time and also it would take uh, a long time to understand how they fit in the logic of, of uh, Canto 10. So I'm going to skim through them and uh, we know from uh, Thomas Aquinas that he presents introduces himself first, Thomas Aquino. We see that at verse uh, 99, who is close to Alberto e di Cologna. Albert the Great, who, uh, who was um, a master of St. Thomas. St. Thomas was a pupil of Albert the Great. And uh, we know that, for example, Albert the Great somehow was in the possession of uh, the, the Greek texts of Aristotle, who were still uh, prohibited in universities and uh, he gave them to read and to work on to St. Thomas. So St. Thomas was one of the first to really have access to Aristotle in, in his circles, and that's probably one of the elements that made him even more enthusiastic to, to work on, uh, on Aristotle's uh, philosophy. Then the third one is uh, Gratian, of the uh, theologian of the 12th century, who organized the canon, the canon law. The fourth one is Pietro Lombardo, Peter Lombard, 12th century monk. Then we have number five, the great Solomon, from verse 109 to verse 114. La quinta luce, che tra noi più bella, the most beautiful and most splendid light among us, is Solomon. We'll see there is a, a follow-up on Solomon later on. Number six is uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, who was converted by St. Paul, and Dante believed that he had written a uh, a work about the different angels, the orders of angels. Then later it was uh, understood that it wasn't this Dionysius from the first century who wrote it, but uh, somebody five centuries later. The seventh one is Orosius, who wrote the defense of uh, Christian religion. Del cui latino Augustine si provide. St. Augustine learned the proper technical terminology of, of, the, juridical, of the juridical work from Orosius. Number eight is Boethius, the author of De Consolatione Philosophia. Great Christian, he today is a saint, and there will be so much to say about Boethius. Number nine is uh, Isidore, Bishop of Seville, 
who wrote a, a great text on uh, etymologies. He brought together all the information they had about etymologies of, of words. Number 10, Venerable Bede, an ecclesiast ecclesiastical historian of Britain. Number 11, Richard of St. Victor. He was a Scottish theologian from the 12th century. And finally, number 12, uh, Seger of, Bra of Brabant, a 13th century theologian who studied and taught at the Sorbonne in Paris and who was possibly the greatest antagonist um, or the greatest competitor of St. Thomas, one of the greatest competitors of St. Thomas. This choice of uh, having him presented last and uh, celebrated in a very positive light by St. Thomas Aquinas is done on purpose by Dante to go more and more um, towards this harmony. Yes, they had been competing in life, but Dante wants to show that here in heaven there is no competition. They are very much one thing as the choir of, of, of all the souls. Finally, we have the seventh part. Seventh part is goes from verse 139 to verse 148. And it's pure beauty. It's a poetry of the highest highest uh, um, level. In the come orologio, orologio means uh, clock, or it could even mean watch, but obviously in Dante's time there were some clocks that were pretty big and they were used in uh, monasteries as alarms or to signal the time when, the, when certain prayers had to be done. So there were some clocks already. Come orologio, che ne chiami nell'ora che la sposa di Dio surge. La sposa di Dio, the bride of God, is the church. So, ammattinar lo sposo perché l'ami, che l'una parte e l'altra tira e urge. Many commentators and scholars who understand Dante's language better than I do have commented that this last part is written in such a, a musical and harmonic way that it's impossible that Dante didn't think to make it on purpose to sound as sweet and musical as possible to signify the harmony uh, that he wants to show. In fact, he also uses these uh, words that are very strange, tin tin. In his times, uh, they were not even probably used in poetry, these uh, sound words, tin tin. It's the sound of the little bell in the clock. Uh, it was called orologio destatore, a clock that was waking up the monks for their prayers. So the verse sounds tin tin sonando con si dolce nota, che il ben disposto spirito d'amor turge, così vidio la gloriosa rota, muoversi e render voce a voce in tempra, e in dolcezza che esser non po' nota, se non colà dove gioir si insempra. The sweetness and such a chord that they cannot be known, except where joy is everlasting. The verb in sempra is an invention of Dante and means to last forever. What a beautiful conclusion of a, of a splendid, splendid canto. I, I'm sorry if this was a little bit longer than usual, but uh, I hope it was worth it for you as, uh, as you listen and you enjoy this Canto 10 of Paradiso. Thank you very much again.